There are many paths into photography. You may wish to sell stock, you may wish to, to just sort of shoot jobs for people. I was a general photographer for most of the time, photographing anything from hotels and restaurants through to, I don't know, weddings, parties, things like that. And I love doing those things involving the people. I am predominantly a documentary photographer. That is what I love. The thing is, if you want to move into professional photography, it's finding a way to stand out from the noise in the background. When I began, there was no social media marketing. And I think what I did back in the day is actually more relevant now than it ever was. Simply because by doing it the old way, you will stand out from the background noise. Now, I can only tell you my journey and how I got into it. If you're a younger viewer and you're thinking, nah, you can't do this without social media and all the rest of it, I'm gonna ask you to please consider this because it's impossible for us to learn what we think we already know. So please put aside your preconceptions and focus on what there may be left to learn, not what you've already learned. For example, one of my preconceptions was, I went to a talk by a wonderful wildlife photographer called Heather Angel. And at the end, she threw it open to questions. She did an AMA. Now, during her talk, she had said how she never allowed a client to have an original transparency to scan. She only ever supplied duplicates. My question to her was, how long did it take you to reach that point? Because clients were like saying, you know, no, we want an original. We want the original. We're not taking duplicates because they're not such good quality. <laughs> and Heather loved that question. Her response was, nobody ever considers the 10 years that I spent sweeping floors, working in a hairdresser, working as a waitress in order to get together money to fund trips to Antarctica and Africa and South America to photograph wildlife and to slowly build a reputation, to work nights writing articles for magazines and all the rest of it whilst living in a little tiny apartment. And this is the thing, there is always effort involved one way or another. So what is <clears throat> my journey? How did it all begin? Well, I'm lucky enough now to run workshops all over the world, have photography courses, but it wasn't always that way. Because I started out as a farm boy and then moved on to driving diggers and earth moving equipment and photography was my hobby. I wasn't very good at it, but I did enjoy it. It was absolutely brilliant. Those moments when I got a good one, going out into the forest early in the morning, walking around, looking at the trees. And this was the key, even though I didn't get particularly good photographs, Photography had made me look at the world differently. I actually looked at it instead of passing through it. I did look at scenery and consider it from different angles. I looked at people and places and things in a whole new different way. And I think, to be honest, that was the thing which I enjoyed the most. It was just a wonderful insight onto a world which I had never really noticed. My first camera, was a Minolta X700. My brother suggested that I buy it. He got into photography before me and he is a very, very good photographer. Now I took that camera everywhere with me. It rode in a holster strapped onto my hip and I would just photograph anything, all those early morning walks, all that stuff. It was absolutely wonderful. I read magazines and books. I got them out of the library. I poured over them trying to figure out the mysteries of exposure, of light and composition. Light was a really, really big one. But over time, slowly, slowly, I started to get a little bit better at it. Now, this is a totally different story and we will come to that another time if you guys are interested. But I found myself at the age of 29 in a situation whereby I had everything everybody wanted. I had security, great job, great relationship, shed full of motorbikes. Who doesn't love a shed full of motorbikes? 
but I was unhappy and I'd always wanted to travel. And so I sold all of my belongings that wouldn't fit into a rucksack. I genuinely sold the lot. And what was left a few days before my flight, it went into the tip. And I bought a one-way ticket to the other side of the world to see what would happen. Several adventures, six months of traveling in Australia. I ended up in Africa, hitchhiking and busing from Nairobi down to Johannesburg, where I bought an old car. <clears throat> There's me sitting on the bonnet of it. Somewhere in the mountains alongside the border with Mozambique and Zimbabwe in the region of um, Chimani Mani. An early selfie. I put my Canon Epoca film camera on the ground and, and sort of set the timer, ran back, sat on the car so I'd look windswept and interesting. There are of course many stories between all of these pictures which I'm not going to go into here and now. But one of the great things about photos is they are time travel. When you scroll on your phone, you're time traveling and you can relive all those memories and moments and pieces of excitement along the way. And I'll be happy to share some of the stories of some of these photos and others with you another time if you would like me to. But whilst in Africa, on that journey of a lifetime, somewhere around seven months in, I think it must have been, I found myself staying in the home of this man, Ken Brown no relative. He was English. He had lived in South Africa for over 30 years. He'd done very well for himself in life. He and his family welcomed me into their home, into their open arms, and it became my home in Africa for a good four months, I think. I would disappear for weeks on end, <clears throat> exploring deserts and goodness knows what. But one evening, sitting out on the stoop behind Ken's house, and it was this very evening that I took this photograph, he looked at me and said, so what are you going to do with the rest of your life? And I didn't know because I had left all that security, all that safety, all that regular income because I wasn't happy and I didn't know where to go and I didn't know how to answer his question. But he blackmailed me. He said, you're living in my home, in my house, sitting on my, ch my step, in my chair, eating my food, and you're not going to get out of my chair until you tell me what you're going to do with the rest of your life. Big question, but a valuable one, and I think more people should ask it. It was wriggly, it was squirmy, and it was very, very uncomfortable. But eventually, kicking and screaming, he dragged it from me that what I would most like to do would be to turn my hobby, photography, which I wasn't very good at, into a living, into a livelihood. See if I could use it to travel. Ken looked at me and said, well, go and do it then. I can't do that, Ken. I'm an at-work digger driver. And he said, exactly. Everyone thinks they're a shopkeeper or a postman or a digger driver, so they don't even try to fulfill their goals, dreams and ambitions. So if you try, you've got a head start over the rest of this planet. It was like being hit round the face with a wet haddock. I thought, he's right. I'm going to do it. I went into my room and got the map out and thought, what else do I want to do while I'm in Africa? Figured out I wanted to go up to Botswana and other places and drive down through the Namib Desert, etc. <clears throat> Figured out I'd need another three months to do all that, went to Cape Town the following day, booked a return flight to the UK. Why the UK? Simply because I know the rules here. I know how it works. It would be much easier to learn how to become a photographer in the UK. So here is the home I found when I returned to the UK. Remember, I'd sold everything. I had nothing left. There was a little bit of money left in the bank and that was all. I found this old mobile home in the corner of a field behind a farm and I rented it. <clears throat> I looked at different ways of learning, going to university, um, going to college, all this sort of stuff, but eventually decided I was going to teach myself how to master photography. I signed on to income support, I explained what I wanted to do and asked them if that was okay because I didn't want to get into trouble. They said that it was, also gave me access to night school and other things. I talked one of my teachers into taking me out on some photo shoots with him just so I could be in that environment. He introduced me to other photographers. I started working for them unpaid for nothing, <clears throat> just to be 
in that environment. <clears throat> and gradually, things began to click. I started to understand how it worked. And also watching how these guys worked, it gave me insights into how they ran their business. So hanging out with someone who's already doing it, I would suggest is a really important thing to do because it will give you insights into things that you've no idea about. How to find customers, how to deal with customers, how to deal with a customer complaint and have them leave happy. All that stuff is really, really important. So Park Photographics in Southampton is somewhere where I worked for a very, very long time. Now I remember something back then <clears throat> about photography which I didn't know and I didn't know that I didn't know that I didn't know it. There was a huge storm over the Isle of Wight near where I live and I remember photographing. I shot a whole roll of 36. That's a £10 investment back then and when you're living on income support, that's a lot. I shot a whole roll of 36. So excited of these pictures of the moody sky and the light coming under and the, the forks of lightning and all this stuff. I had the film developed and was so utterly disappointed with the pictures. I just thought, is there any reason to continue? I obviously can't do this. What I didn't know that I didn't know that I didn't know back then was that the person who developed the film and printed the pictures had absolute control over how your pictures looked. I didn't realize that. And in my disgust, threw those negatives away. I was telling this story to um, Phil, who worked at Park Photographics, he ran their photographic lab, and he was a brilliant hand printer. I told him about it. He said, bring me the eggs. He said, they're probably fine. I'll print them up for you. <laughs> Too late. I'd thrown them away. But this is how we learn things. We learn things through pain, through things going wrong, through screwing up. That is how we learn. Never be afraid to make a mistake, because they are the most valuable things of all. So we're moving forward now, maybe 10 months in, working at Park Photographics. I spent every day in that caravan, reading books, practicing, shooting film. Maybe the reason I bang on so much about thinking like a photographer and being careful is because when you've got 40 pound a week to live on, and it costs you 10 of those 40 every 36 clicks of the camera, boy, are you careful. Boy, do you think about it. But over time, I got better and better and better. And eventually reached a point where I thought, I need to go and look for some clients. So I started using the systems of income support. They gave, there was a thing called Job Finders Club, <clears throat> where you could answer you know, job applications, make phone calls, arrange appointments. I used it to cold call businesses. I sat there with the yellow pages, going through them, just, just literally ringing the number. Hi, my name's Mike, I'm a photographer. Is there anything I can help you with? Many of them said no. Fine, have a nice day. But some of them said yes. And slowly my confidence in doing this began to grow. That brochure on the left, the holiday brochure <clears throat> for Hoban Holidays, I'd gone to a presentation, I don't know what it was about, probably business and marketing or something, but I figured it was an opportunity to learn something. Walking out of the holiday park or around reception, they had all these photographs and they were bloody awful. They really were not good. <clears throat> so I went to the reception and said, excuse me, but who's your marketing manager? And they gave me the name of the guy, Charles, can't remember his surname now, Charles. But they gave me his name and they gave me his phone number and I phoned him up and said, hello Charles, I've just been to this event at Hoban Park and I'm sorry mate, but your picture's bloody awful. You need a photographer. <laughs> now, I know that sounds terribly big headed, maybe arrogant, but the thing is, doing something like that, it makes you stand out. You stand out from the crowd. What is going on? This looks to me as though this isn't working again. Is anybody there? There's something not working. Guys, are you still there? Because I'm having all sorts of technical problems at this end. 
good because when I look at my screen to check the live stream it just isn't there it's just black so <clears throat> thank you guys and apologies for this I have no way to know what on earth is going on right so I've said to Charles you need a photographer now that might sound terribly arrogant but the thing is it's about standing out from the crowd how many other people had done that the confidence had grown how do you grow your confidence you do things that are a little bit uncomfortable you don't like doing them you know you get sweaty and you feel really nervous but when you've done it you think oh I survived hmm and then you do something a little bit more uncomfortable and a little bit more uncomfortable so anyway I met with this chap Charles and and we had a talk and for probably two or three years they used to hire me to go around their holiday parks just taking photographs which they could use in their brochure I ended up with places like Elmer's Court Country Club <clears throat> did a load of work for them. I was completely blown away when Hampshire Magazine used one of my pictures on the cover one Christmas. It was just the most amazing, amazing feeling in the world. I thought it might be interesting, because I'm a nosy bugger, to see if I could write some articles. <clears throat> And I managed to do one about uh, Jean-Christophe Novelli, the English TV celebrity chef, and some of his restaurants. I did another one for Hampshire Magazine about farming, about milk production. I love doing it. It was just the best. Now, slowly, slowly, of course, these clients began to grow. We started to get a few more, one at a time. The other thing I used to do was to cold call. There was no internet. There was no website. So I had, I thought I had it in here, but I haven't, <clears throat> a portfolio. One of those things, you know, you opened it up and there was all the pictures inside. And I hit the streets. I'd go around industrial estates, knocking on doors. Hi, sorry to bug you. Um, I just wondered, do you ever need any photographs doing? Can I show you some pictures? Sometimes they'd say no. Well, that's fair enough. Just don't waste time. Wish them a nice day. Move on. Sometimes they'd say yes, sometimes they'd say the person you need to see isn't here. In which case, don't take that as a no. Just take it as a, okay, well, when will they be here? And can I make an appointment to see them? Slowly, 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 this began to evolve and it began to grow. So, <clears throat> another way I found in was to start talking to wedding shops. Because bridal shops, they've got all these people who are getting married. So if you can make friends with the bridal shop and show them your pictures, then maybe they will tell some of their clients. Now, I had a head start in this one because Park Photographic shot a lot of weddings. And over that year when I worked unpaid, I was doing a lot of weddings. Now, trust me, the first one I did on my own was terrifying. The sweat was running down my neck. But hey, it panned out, I got some great shots. I'd been well mentored by Billy and had a lot of experience through working with him at Park Unpaid. So I started to get a few pictures together. The bridal shop started telling their clients and I started to make friends with the hotels because they could then recommend me as well. I also became a complete tart for a bit of publicity. I started entering competitions. Because I just thought, any idiot can put an advert into a magazine or a newspaper, but if you can get the newspaper or the magazine to write about you, that gives a level of credibility, um, which is totally missing just from advertising. And that's really the only reason I started entering awards, because if I got an award, I'd be there banging on the door going, hey, guess what, I won an award. And I think in the end they got a bit bored because I did win quite a lot of them at that time. Yes, Mike, we know. But nonetheless, there started to be, you know, a ball rolling here. And once you get the ball rolling, just keep pushing it and pushing it and pushing it. Now, I know we've got social media. I know we've got all that <clears throat> good stuff there, which appears really, really easy. But as I said earlier, there is so much noise in that world. How do you stand out? We are entering a world of AI, of artificial intelligence, of automated blog posts and all this stuff. How do you stand out from all that noise? If you start to actually approach people as human beings, boy, do you stand out at the moment. But I digress. 
I was a very early adopter of the more reportage, documentary style wedding photography. Billy, bless his heart, was a lovely, lovely guy and I owe him so much. Sadly, he died quite some years ago. But he wasn't the most creative of photographers. He'd stand people in the corner of the churchyard and basically we took the same picture over and over again with different people in it. I was an early adopter of a more documentary style because, hey, that's what I like doing, documentary stuff. Now, back then, very few people were doing it. And so, therefore, it stood out again. And I found myself getting more work to do, more weddings. In fact, at one point, I was even turning away more than I was shooting. I really enjoyed it, and I still do. Weddings are just such good fun. Now, of course, as you know, I have a YouTube channel because you are watching me on it. Now, over time, things evolved, and then, of course, the social media thing, it still has a place today because I would never have ended up working for these guys without it. <clears throat> they saw something online. I think it was actually the workshop I run in Zurich in Switzerland and their head of marketing and PR got in touch and said, is there any value for me? She's head of PR. She wanted to learn how to take photos so that when they had, I don't know, someone, some VIP coming through their facility, they could get a great photo for their press and PR. As it happens, I said, that workshop is not appropriate for you. But I did a couple of days personal training with them and then they started bringing me in on a few special projects and so now it has kind of evolved of course it has moved on and i'm getting to do workshops all over the world and i'm getting to speak and talk at some pretty prestigious events and it has been an extraordinary journey from the boy who used to drive a combine harvester to getting to hang out with his Highness Sheikh Sultan bin Al Kazmi, deputy ruler of one of the Arab Emirates. So that's kind of like the journey in a nutshell. And I do seriously believe that if you can make yourself stand out by doing something different, then it is a really great way of going about things. Still use social media, of course. But of course, it also depends on what sort of photography do you want to do? Are you prepared to pay the cost of creating photography as a business to earn money from it? Now, I don't mean a cost in advertising, I mean a cost in time and dedication. Heather Angel invested 10 years as she worked in hairdressers and restaurants to build up her skills, her knowledge base, her authenticity, her integrity, and a base of clients who wanted to use her work. Overall, how long did it take me to establish myself from, you know, those very first early days of doing a few jobs and going down to the Dole office where I was signing on and saying, hey, I don't need any money this week, I earned some. It was a good five years before I could actually cut those ties free. These things don't happen overnight. Now, I don't know, I got a question for you guys. Is there anyone here who is thinking you would love to go into full-time photography as a profession? Please just put a me into the comments. If you are thinking you would like to become a full-time photographer, pop a me into the comments, just so I can gauge how many of you there might be in this group. Matthew, thank you. Bob, anyone else? Yeah, we got a few of you. <laughs> oh, I said me, not not me. <laughs> okay, there's a few of you. And that's pretty brave. I get it. That's pretty brave. I get it. So, the reason I asked that question is because there is no point in me talking about some of that stuff if none of you are interested in doing it. Please don't put no's in there if you're not. I'm not interested. It's just the yeses. So some of you guys are. <clears throat> yes, there is a progression. There is a journey to take. There is work to do. Yes, there's social media. Qualifications, I'd say they're totally irrelevant and unimportant. What is important is that you can do the work that you can communicate with potential clients and that you do communicate with them. 
very authentically, openly and honestly. For example, I very nearly didn't do this shoot. In fact, I told them I didn't want to do it because there were so many things that could have gone wrong with it. And because I live in one country and this shoot was in another and they just wanted me for one day, I was saying to them, please, why don't you just get a local photographer to do it? Because I can't deliver what you want. If the weather doesn't play ball, all I can give you is a really crap picture you'll be disappointed with. And they said, because there is only one day. But once I'd gone through all the things that could go wrong and all the reasons I didn't want to do it, they actually wanted me to do the shoot more than they wanted anyone else to do it. They thanked me for being authentic and honest and open with them. If you do a shoot and things go wrong, own up to it. Don't blame anyone else. Just own up to it and ask them what it will take to make them happy. What can I do to put this right? If you're doing it professionally, make sure you have insurance. Not just public liability in case someone falls over your tripod, but also professional indemnity. What if you screw up? We all screw up. I'm a master at screwing up. Professional indemnity insurance means that if I do screw up, I forget to put a card in the camera, I tread on the camera, I don't know what, I just cock the whole thing up, the insurance will cough up and we can do it again tomorrow. Now you can't do that with a wedding. Weddings are unique events and that's one of the reasons I love them. The adrenaline, the storytelling, the being trusted with a milestone event in someone's life is just awesome. But it's something to consider you do need to get those insurances if you're gonna do this professionally. I would also say that if you're gonna do it professionally, you need two sets of photographic equipment. I have walked into a shoot, dropped the camera, it's gone bouncing down some stone steps, smashed the pieces at the bottom. It's not great if you go, oh, sorry, I broke my camera, I'm going home now. You know, sometimes it takes weeks to organize a shoot, to get everything into one place. So you need two sets of everything. Make sure you back everything up. I've got backups of backups of backups of backups. I've got a drawer full of hard drives down there. If anyone's interested in how I manage my files and the photo shoots so I know where everything is on all those multiple hard drives, then um, please just put, a, just, put some, just put a Y into the comments because if you are, I will do one of these live broadcast AMAs about that another time. So let's look at the next type of photographer. So what is it you're looking for? Is this, are you looking to do, who's looking to do just part time? You know, photographing restaurants, maybe the local garage, a few portraits, maybe some baby photos, you know, that sort of thing. Please just tell me, just say me into the comments so I can see, right, a lot of you are interested in me doing a thing about file management, so I'll do that another time. So the part-time people, okay. Cool, so there's quite a few of you in here. Got it. The same thing applies for you as it does to the full-time people. You've still got to find those people. The most important thing is that you go and find them. Don't just put an ad onto Facebook because the chances are not much will happen. Also, think about how you value your work. Because if you want to be paid for it, and you want to be paid, well, let's just say, well. I'm not talking thousands of pounds. I have friends who do portraits. You won't get uh, one of them in particular out of bed for less than two grand. <clears throat> but you want to be paid well. You want to walk away from a portrait shoot with, I don't know, seven or eight hundred pounds. Make sure you can do it. Don't um and ah. Make sure you get your skill levels up there. How do you break into that? Well, if you find someone who wants, say, some portraits doing or some pictures of the restaurant or the car or the hotel or the whatever it may be, just be authentic and say, I would love to do it, but I'm not 100% confident. Don't charge them. Tell them you won't charge them. Or say, pay me what you think it's worth. But be straight with them. Because if you go in there all nervous, they will pick that up. They will know and then they won't be you know, confident in you. The whole thing starts to become a downward spiral. But if you're authentic and honest about it and just say, look, I'm not entirely sure what's gonna happen here, but if you're up for that, let's give it a lash. You're in agreement. You're in a great place. How do you find those customers? Of course, it doesn't hurt to put a few things onto Facebook, but in all honesty, my experience of Facebook marketing is 
it burns money pretty damn fast. Strangely enough, my very good friend, Mr. Paul Tanzi, just said hello to me in the chat a few moments ago. Sorry, Paul, I didn't respond because it was in full flow. Paul is a marketing genius and not even he could make it work. So just a few maybe. But I think the big thing is just to put it out there. If you've got kids at the school, let the other parents know you want to do some, you know, children photography, mother and baby photography, things like that. Think about people you know, groups you know. You want to photograph, I don't know, let's say you like sports. Go around the local football clubs, you know. I don't mean the, the, the big league. I mean the local kids clubs and things like that. Talk to them, tell them who you are. Yeah, you'll have to get checked to make sure that, you know, you've got all the paperwork in place, that you don't have a criminal record, etc. But these are the ways to do it. I strongly recommend actually talking to people rather than just getting lost in the noise of social media. So I think we've kind of come to the end of, if you like, my journey where I arrived, how I did it, just by throwing stones into the pool. Keep throwing stones into the pool, people, because then you throw a stone into the pool, you get ripples come back. Some of those ripples will be good stuff. Some of them maybe not, but you don't have to react to the ones that are not. And also remember to be confident about these things. When you're not confident, own it. Just stand out and go, hey, I'm not quite confident with this, but I want to give it a go. And when you have the sweat running down the back of your neck and you feel really, really uncomfortable, just do it. And you just move into it and then you think, I survived that. What's the next thing I'm a little bit uncomfortable with? So, money. Is there any money in this? There is a lot less money in photography now than there was before. Stock photography, for example, um, it's a lot of work, a huge amount of work. You don't just go and taking pictures of things you like and then hoping to sell them. Stock photography, to make it work, you need to analyse what is going on in the world. What are editors buying? What do they want? Another thing to remember with stock is there is so much of it out there now. And with companies like iStock, etc., what are you looking at? 10, 15 pounds, you can have four or five pictures. That doesn't leave much for the photographer. But if you enjoy doing that, go do it. If you're doing it as a hobby and it just gives you a few pennies for your hobby, go and do it. Give it a go because you'll have fun. And who knows, you might be able to buy a lens at the end of the year. Um, yeah, so let's have a look at our AMA. Let's move on to <clears throat> our questions and I am going to go through the questions that were sent in in advance and then we'll spend a bit of time asking some of these a bit later. Bob Cannon, I just saw you left a question. Hang on to it my friend, please pop it in at the end when I open it up for questions in the chat because I will miss it. There are quite a lot to get through here. Matthew Parsons asked, how did I find the genres of photography which suited me and how did I develop my style? I discovered the genres I liked by just doing as many as possible. The ones that I clicked with, that I gelled with, thought, okay, let's go further down this path. The ones that were just uncomfortable and didn't really enjoy, well, let's just leave that out. Because think about this. If you go and do jobs that you don't enjoy, will you do them particularly well? This is something you should always consider. If you're doing something you love, you're going to be good at it, or you're going to get good at it. If you're doing something, you're just doing it for the money, then it's going to be drudgery. You're not going to get the results. The next part of Matthew's question was, how did I develop my style? We don't develop a style. This is something really important you've got to learn. We do not develop a style. We photograph the way we photograph. We photograph what's in our heart and our soul and our mind. We photograph things the way we see them, the way our creativity puts them together. And those pictures are our style. You don't just think, okay, I'm going to do a pre-Raphaelite style uh, following, I don't know, Rubens or something and try and make all my pictures look like that. Well, you could, but I don't think it's a great way of doing it. Photograph lots of things the way you like and that becomes your style. Denise Savage asked, what was the biggest fail that helped me to learn something important? It's a really good question because of course there have been many fails. The best lessons always come from failure. The one I think was the most fun 
was someone who is now a very famous baker, a chap called Richard Bertinet. <clears throat> he appears on television a lot. He runs the Bertinet Bakery. You can buy his breads in Waitrose and all this sort of stuff. Back then, he was a chef at a local hotel. In fact, he got turned down for the head of bakery at the uh, local Safeway supermarket. <laughs> Look at him now. Um, some friends of his wanted some portraits. They drove two hours down to me in the south of England because they wanted to do them somewhere outdoorsy and somewhere nice and it was drizzly and it was raining and it was a bit crap but they were lovely people. So we give it a go, we've been shooting for a little while, I'm going click and we're kind of having fun, they wanted relaxed stuff and he's picking her up and I'm getting him to swing her around and do sort of silly pirouettes and jump in puddles and all that good stuff. And I just thought, this film's lasting a long time. <laughs> yeah, I did. I didn't have a film in the camera. <laughs> and this is what I mean about owning your screw-ups. Because I told them, guys, you're not going to believe what I've just done. I am so sorry, but I had no film in the camera. Because I owned it and had a laugh with them about it, we did it all again. And the second time round, everything was just so much better. Because in a way, they'd seen me screw up. And I just think they felt more comfortable rather than being confronted with a complete stranger who is faceless and unknowable. They just watched me completely screw up. I think that was a really good one. <clears throat> Big learning experience. And it kind of taught me to always own up to your screw ups or own up to things that you're not comfortable with. Because then you're being a human being and we all, re all relate to authenticity. Another Denise Savage question, were there any hurdles in your thinking you had to work past in the beginning? I think I've already touched on them, Denise, and that was confidence. I was highly unconfident the first few times I went round with that portfolio under my arm, banging on the doors around the industrial estates, going to, you know, classic car garages and saying, can I photograph your cars for you and all that stuff. But over time, you get better at it. Um, the other question Denise asked was, what were the moments, little or big, that kept spurring you on, especially as you took the beginning of the journey? <clears throat> Seeing a delighted customer, that was just brilliant. In shooting some pictures, handing them on to someone, and they were delighted. This was particularly true within the wedding sphere. Um, and I came to love weddings and that's why I think I got pretty good at it because I just loved it. It's just such good fun. Look at me, I'm a loud mouth, I'm a show off. I'm here talking to you on bloody YouTube for goodness sake. Imagine how much fun that is for someone to be in front of 120 strangers. I've got carte blanche to photograph them. I can fool around and mess about as much as I like to provoke reactions and to get things moving. Um, yeah, I think it was seeing happy customers. Um, that's what kept spurring me on, Denise. I don't know if that one helped. Sasha John. <clears throat> Does it make sense to become a professional photographer anymore? How do you become a professional photographer if you don't have money, a social network and support with 58 years of age? Um, does it make sense to become a professional photographer anymore? It is not an easy thing to make a living out of, Sasha. If you want to do this professionally full-time, you do have to find a niche and you do need to be very, very good at what you do indeed. <clears throat> um, there are a lot of people like most of you guys who are hobbyists. You know, look how many people said, I just want to do it at the weekend. It's, it's, it's a nice hobby, you know, and if I get a bit of part time money, that's great. Well, that has put a lot of professional photographers out of business because we can't compete. We can't do it for 200 quid. We've got backups of backups of backups. We've got insurances. We've got two sets of camera equipment. We have all that stuff to compete with. So yes, the rate for professional photography has dropped. However, if there's something you love doing, it depends on your reasons for doing it. How do you define success as a professional photographer? Photographer, If it's not a question of you need the money, then yeah, I'd say you could still find work, you could still do it if you're doing, if your reward is going to be the joy of it or meeting new people or the creativity. Um, but don't go into professional photography thinking you'll become rich. How do you become a professional photographer today if you don't have money, a social network and support? <clears throat> well, I would suggest all the things I talked about earlier can make a difference. 
the key is you've got to be able to deliver the goods. If someone wants a picture of this mug, you've got to know that you can deliver a great picture of this mug. You can't change it into something else, you can't polish a turd, but what you can do is use your knowledge of creativity, light, composition, camera angle, focal length, lens and all that stuff to create a really nice picture of that mug. You do need to have a level of confidence there. As for age, does it matter? Hard to tell. I think in some cases people respect age because it shows experience and in some cases well, maybe not. <clears throat> Nan Kelly asked, any hints or tips on how to photograph people in public? I shy away from street photography as I don't have confidence to approach people. I have no confidence in my ability. Did you find that a problem when you started out and how did you overcome it? Nan, I think I've probably answered those questions throughout what we've just been talking about. Yeah, didn't have much confidence at all to begin with, but then slowly it grew. Um, there is no money if you want to do street photography professionally there isn't really any money in it. Um, who's going to buy it? Who's going to pay you for it? If it's something you want to do for yourself because it's something you want to have a go at, then it's a question of just having a go. You might be uncomfortable, you might not be confident, but have a go. And when you survive it, you'll think, oh, and your confidence muscle has had a, a little workout. You're just that little bit stronger. You can have another go. Nan, if you can, come and join me in London on the Cameras Don't Take Pictures because we spend a morning having a, a chat in the classroom, which is great fun, but then we do a photo walk along the Thames Embankment and over Tower Bridge and all around there. Loads of street photography. So you won't be on your own, you won't be lonely, and I can hold your hand. I hope you can make it. Sandra Sim, I struggle with motivation sometimes when aches and pains set in, the weather is bad for what I want to photograph. How do you motivate yourself when you're not feeling at your best or the weather won't play ball? When it comes to doing it professionally, um, it's like the jet aviation shoot. Um, you tell them the truth. So the weather on that shoot was appalling. The shot which we wanted to get didn't happen. Um, you know, as you can see, it's, 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 you know, here behind me, um, there. <clears throat> the original plan was for a blue sky and the sun coming over the corner of the hangar and all that stuff. We didn't get it because it was just grey and rainy and horrible all day. It was a case of perseverance and waiting and hoping and fingers crossed and as luck would have it, it rained. Um, it's, the ground was wet and sparkly and we had another go at night just in blue hour and actually got a better thing than we would have done before. As for the motivation, yeah, you just got to do it. You just do it. That's all there is to it. Think about mood. So if you're feeling depressed and sad and unmotivated, what does your body do? It does that, doesn't it? It just kind of goes and you walk around with your shoulders slumped. The weight of the world is on your shoulders. But this works the other way around too. Stand up straight, get your shoulders back, take a deep breath, stride out, and you will find by forcing your body to do things which are far more exciting and confident and energetic, it will actually improve your mood. And again, when it comes to professional photography, you just gotta do it. Um, the number of times I have gone on photo shoots when I have been really unwell. I once photographed a wedding on crutches because I had snapped the anterior cruciate ligament in my left knee only seven days before. I can't phone up the couple and say, sorry, I'm not going to photograph your wedding. I'm ill. <clears throat> Others, I had a terrible stomach upset. Uh, I just dosed myself up with pills uh, <laughs> to try and bung myself up. I just got on with it. It was not nice. I was sweaty. I was feeling unwell. My stomach was bubbling and rumbling and I was just hoping I didn't crap myself at some point during the day. You just do it. And then when you get out the other end, you go, I did that. Bloody hell. I hope that helped. Um, by the way, when the weather doesn't pay, play ball, Sandra, it depends what your shoot is. If, it's, if, you, if you're trying to do camper vans on the beach for a company that makes camper vans and they want sunshine and beach balls, that starts to get very, very tricky. Um, and in my day, they had stand down fees. You would book the models, you would book all this stuff, you'd plan it, you'd go out there, the weather would be crap, you stand down and you try again another day. 
in the making of my masterclass in photography, that online course. It's an eight hour course. It took a year to film it pretty much full time. Why? Because I need to demonstrate what to do if the light's like this, what to do if the light's like that. And the number of times we had Joe on location, we had the location, we'd drive somewhere, the weather would change, the light wouldn't do it. We've got to stand down, try again another day. That's why it took a year to make that online course. It's the same with professional photography. There are some things outside your control, but you have to make your client aware of it. Hervé Guibert Gallet, I love your name, my friend. During your photographic journey, what was the most rewarding moment without looking at the money side? <clears throat> um, the most rewarding thing for me is pretty much the teaching side because I love light bulb moments. From the photography commission sides, um, I think there's a slide here I didn't show you because I was all razzed up and uncomfortable because we're having so many technical problems. Let me see if I can show it to you. <laughs> Very early photograph, the one on the left of Concord. Bournemouth Airport had got a big runway put in. <clears throat> and Concord, they, Bath Travel were chartering Concord to do some stuff. They needed some photographs that said, it's got to be eye-catching, it's got to be upright, it will fit a magazine cover, clearly Concord, it's got to be dramatic and it's got to say Concord comes here. <clears throat> day of the shoot, it's all grey, cloudy, horrible dull day, miserable. What are local regional airports or any airport for that matter? They're a mess, aren't they? There's trolleys everywhere and trucks and airplanes and stuff in the background. It's nearly impossible to get a nice clear shot. So the shot I did was the kind of classic lying under the nose and I put a bit of a tilt on the camera and the steps are just there leaning up against the aircraft. Now of course the sky wasn't purple. This was when Photoshop first appeared and this was the first image I ever made in Photoshop. So I cut the aircraft and the steps out. Um, another slide I forgot to show you. <clears throat> You may recognise the girl from standing on the steps. This I got, a, I got a Kodak Gold Award for this picture many years ago. This is all to do with the getting awards. But a different shot from that day, I cut her out and put her on the steps. So this was completely made in Photoshop. The sun coming around the fuselage, made it in Photoshop, added the lens flare in Photoshop. It is totally fake. <laughs> but it won a bunch of awards and the client got what they wanted. A rabbit was pulled out of the hat. Maybe there's something about me and aeroplanes where somehow we managed to pull some rabbits out of hats. Um, yeah, so I hope, I hope that sort of helps. But also weddings, Hervé. I just love doing them. I just love it. It's such an honour and a privilege to be given, to be trusted with a milestone event in someone's life and to be allowed to go and document it. You can't think about cameras and settings and stuff when you're shooting at a wedding. You've got to be able to do it with as much thought as you give to breathing because you're thinking about time management, the shots which they've said they want to get, capturing the fun, the laughter, who kissed who, who was doing what, who was, who was laughing, and you've got to make sure you document it all properly. You've got time to think about lenses and stuff, but it's such a privilege, and I love the adrenaline of it because you can't get it wrong. Linda O'Neill asked, did I ever shoot film and process it yourself? Yes and yes. Um, <clears throat> as mentioned earlier, all my earlier work was on film. I did have my own black and white darkroom and in the early days when I had no money at all, I often used to try and talk people into having black and white done, particularly if it was PR for papers, because back in those days, there were very few colour publications and black and white was better for PR. So I had time but no money, so I'd just go in my darkroom and print them. Um, not really relevant today though. Jonathan Kimberley asked, are there any genres that you still want to explore? I can't think of any off the top of my head, Jonathan. Sports doesn't really appeal. Pet photography really doesn't appeal. I have done a tiny bit of it. Um, maybe a little bit more in the way of portraiture, but it would be more travel portraiture, the sort of stuff that I shoot when I'm doing, you know, photo workshops, different cultures, different people, where do they live, what do they do? <clears throat> Is there a genre? No. 
And I would recommend everybody just shoot everything. As we said earlier, how do you discover what you're good at? By shooting all sorts of different things. Um, one of my customers, a guy called Mohammed Mirza, he lives in Bahrain. He came, on, he came to Cambodia with me on a workshop. He came to Iceland with me on a workshop. Uh, avid photography, he was always shooting stuff. He started going to Africa and photographing wildlife and boy did he find his niche. That man is good. And a couple of years ago I just said, you know, you've really found your home with photography. You don't need to bother with anything else and he doesn't anymore. Um, in fact, I suggested he enter the Exposure International Photography Festival Awards, which he did. And back earlier this year in February, I bumped into him there because he was a runner up in the wildlife category. Um, you know, go and explore things and then you will find the ones that work and that you love. Paul Whittle has asked, I've also collected some lenses and stuff and uh, I'm uncertain which to concentrate on whilst getting back into Ultimate Beginners. Gosh, that's an old course. Hello, Paul. <clears throat> um, not of lenses and things. Felt most comfortable with the F-Zoom. I don't know if this is a professional photography question, really, Paul. Um, I would definitely shoot digitally. I'm not quite sure what your question is, my friend. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry that you lost your wife and kind of lost your way with the training. But... Um, Yeah, I'm sorry, my friend, I'm not quite understanding the question, so I am going to move on. Mariner's asked, my question is, what did you do when you got discouraged on your journey to become a pro photographer? Um, I don't think I really did get discouraged. It was just something I thought, no, I want to do this. This is what I want to do. Life is often about making a choice and then you've got to go for it. You've got to dive in and give it everything, even when you're not enjoying it. Um, yeah, you just got to go for it and, and jump out of bed. <clears throat> if you want to find out what it's like to just kind of go for it, when you wake up tomorrow morning, set your alarm for maybe an hour earlier than you want to get up. And then when it rings, jump out of bed and go and do it. Don't lie there. Don't snooze. Just leap out of bed. Stick your face in some cold water. It will wake you up like that and you'll feel brilliant. <clears throat> but you won't want to do it. Tony Cox has asked, I have been a keen amateur photographer for a number of years and over that time have taken the odd image I thought was good enough to be commercially saleable, but I've never pursued the option. However, I have recently retired, would be keen to supplement income with the odd sale. How would you advise I explore this further, get my images exposed to the right customer base? The thing is, Tony, you've got to figure out who are your customers, what do you shoot, who is going to like them? A better way of going about this is to, to choose a customer base and then go and shoot what they want. It's like stock photography. When you know what is current, what is topical, what people want, then you go and shoot it. Um, the only other thing you can do is to then start looking at different places that you can go. I mean, you've got sites like Etsy's for art type photography. Um, you can generate little bits of income from different online things. It's, it's, it's a very broad question, my friend, and it's a difficult one to answer without knowing precisely what you want to do. Um, what is it that you like to shoot? What do you, how do you define commercially saleable? Something to remember is that we might go out and shoot pictures we like, but is anyone going to buy them? I know for a fact, whenever I post pictures online, the ones that I like the most get the fewest interactions and likes. There have been a number of times I have posted pictures on our Facebook and other places and thought, oh, I don't know if I post this, I don't really like it. And then everyone goes, wow, it's amazing. My number one picture on Clickersnap that has got thousands and thousands of views. Yeah, it's a nice picture. It's actually from the um, masterclass course. It's one I took whilst doing that. It's a nice picture of a lady admiring the waves and the waves have got a bit of movement blur in them. But I wouldn't go it's awesome or amazing, and yet it is the number one most viewed picture in my clicker snap. I don't know, it's a difficult one. You kind of need to think about what is it you want to sell. Is it landscapes where you need to go and find out places where people buy that and then give it a go? Sorry, that was a very vague and long-winded answer. Kenneth Cordwell asked, if money was no object, what would your dream motorcycle be? Do you have a favorite place you've photographed? I love Asia. That's probably the area I have enjoyed photographing the most. 
I think it's a fascinating culture and I love the fact people really are just so friendly and lovely and gentle. Um, otherwise, yeah, anywhere I haven't been, I have never traveled in South America and it's something I really want to do. Um, <clears throat> Dream motorcycle, I have got my ultimate stable of motorcycles already. My old Triumph Legend, that scruffy old thing I ride around that's all dented and dirty. Best motorcycle I've ever owned. I have no desire for anything else. Kenneth Caldwell. Oh, sorry, no, I've just done that one. Chris Tetlow, your trip to Ukraine had some very emotional photography. Is emotion essential to good photography? That is a great question, Chris. Is emotion essential for good photography? Um, I wouldn't say it's essential but it's good if you can provoke an emotion. And I was so impressed with your question that I did go and grab a couple of pictures from the Ukraine trip because what was more emotional? I mean, this, this guy was sitting in the bed looking at the place where his legs used to be with this woman. She just was holding his hand, had a forehead there. She became aware of me as I was taking the picture. And it was just heartbreaking. The tears were just pouring down my face. Um, you just get on with it. Um, does that provoke an emotion for you? Will it provoke an emotion in someone else who maybe thinks, you know what, I, w I want to do something. I want to help. Maybe I'll go and volunteer at the local collection centre. Um, maybe I'll, I'll put some money towards something. I don't know. I do think some emotion is a good one. Um, and it wasn't all doom and gloom either because, you know, this girl, she's just come through the gate from Ukraine. And there's this, just this happy little moment when... when she saw this guy, I'm pretty sure it's her father, and just her face just lit up and they, they got this hug. I was just a moment too late in getting into position to shoot it. Um, emotion again. <clears throat> this is in Lviv, in Ukraine. You know, there's a bloody war going on. And, and the people told us that at the beginning, everyone was indoors. No one went outside. They're all hiding in the house. And then, yeah, a few missiles came in. Not a lot. Lviv hasn't been hit tremendously heavily but hey think about your own hometown just one missile's enough to put you off eh? but they just thought you know what i'm not going to hide and they came out and, and you know this this is just in the street kids look at the fun that they're having i do think emotion is important if you can stroke an emotion in your viewer regardless of what the picture's about particularly if it's a wedding photo maybe then it will have more power so yeah i do think that it is essential to have some emotion stroking aspect. Andrew Bennett has asked, what sort of capital did you have behind you to take that step right at the beginning? Um, did I have a work stream planned or just a good feeling that it would be there for me? Yeah, I trusted Andrew. Did I have any capital behind me? No, I was on income support. I had no money, no money. Um, I was doing the whole thing of sitting there thinking I'm not lighting the fire tonight. It's, <laughs> I haven't got any money. I'll just put on some more jumpers. Um, stuff like that. Scrounging meals off my brother, going around other people's houses and things like that. But it was just like, no, I'm going to do this and being determined and keeping going. <clears throat> but no, I didn't have money behind me. I returned to England with maybe, I don't know, couple of thousand pounds left in the bank that doesn't last long does it when you're paying your rent your heating and all the rest of it um what else okay your skills lay in sports you'll find it very difficult to break into yeah well think about it who wants to buy pictures of sports what sort of sports are you talking about the school sports day? Then that's event photography. You then need to start looking at what do I need to do event photography? Um, you know, if I want to photograph, you know, the local kids football league matches, that sort of thing. How will you send those, sell those pictures? The only way you'll probably do it is through event. So you need to have a processing lab set up so you can be shooting pictures. And as you're shooting these pictures, they're going and being developed and, you know, printed rather, developed, <coughs> printed. You know, and then you make a big noise and tell all the parents, hey, come and buy pictures of your little darling. 
uh, playing football, for example. Same thing you could do with Jim Carners, you know, horse shows, stuff like that. Depends what sort of sports you're on about. If you're talking about big league sports, selling to magazines and things like that, that is a whole other world. Um, yeah, it's not easy. But again, make contact with people in that world. How do you do that? Don't know, get the magazines, find out who's doing it, look at the websites, find out who the people are, contact them. Hi, I wanna do this. Get yourself a portfolio of work. Go and photograph some matches and stuff. Chat up some groundsmen at some things. Get some shots. My brother photographs the local youth team because he was chairman of it for a long, long time. And he's very good at it. He's got some fantastic pictures of football, but the kid's doing it. But, you know, it's, it's the same thing. I hope that helped. Katie Saunders, you asked, what would be your advice to the chronically ill or disabled photographer who's considering Clickersnap as a source of passive income? Um, I'd say this depends how you define chronically ill or disabled, and I'm really, really sorry if you are. It's always heartbreaking <clears throat> when someone loses their health. Um, there is a Disabled Photographers Association. Whether or not that is any help to you, I don't actually know them. They may have some inroads onto ways of doing things. My ex-girlfriend many, many years ago was disabled and her photos were always interesting because she was shooting from a different angle. She was shooting from a wheelchair angle as opposed to a standing up angle and it just gave them a little edge. Clicker snap as a source of passive income. So anyone who doesn't know, Clicker snap is a photo sharing site and uh, if you post pictures that are interesting that people view, it shares its revenue stream with you. They have a sponsorship thing on here because I am part of it and I'm involved in it, even though they're not paying into me doing this. Um, don't view ClickerSnap necessarily as a source of passive income on views. You might make a little bit of money on views, interact with people in the feed, tell people your pictures are there, invite people to come and have a look, make sure you're uploading great pictures. You're better off uploading five really great pictures than a thousand mediocre ones with five great ones in there because the great ones will get lost in the noise. Um, however, you can sell your work. For some of you who are talking about how do I sell my photos, how do I sell prints, maybe my landscapes, my still lives, Clicker Stamp is another place you can do that because the shops are now getting built in. They've had a lot of problems getting the coding right, but they are being built in and they will have an international distribution thing. So if you've got some great work and you want to sell it, it is a vehicle by which you can do it. But remember, you've still got to find your clients. You've still got to tell people the pictures are there. Invite people in, market and promote them. Um, yeah, as for just getting you know the payments on views, it's a very, very small payment on a view. But hey, it's, it's money no one else is giving you. Um, you need to interact with people. You need to put quite a lot in, but is it a passive income stream? No, there is no such thing as a passive income stream. I'm sorry. It may look like you put videos on YouTube and um, you know the money rolls in, for example. Well, what you don't see is that it takes maybe 20 or 30 hours to create each video. Then you've got to do all that work um, and other things like that. There is no such thing as a passive income stream. So we've come to the end <clears throat> of those questions. I thought I saw Emmeline say something. Hello, Emmeline Churcher. Um, Emmeline, you just said that I'm fun to work for. Are you ill? Anyway, are we there? Ah, oh, here is a question. What are the three golden awards behind you and how did they impact your photography? These are exposure awards. These are from the International Photography Festival way a ton. I was really hoping that they might be gold. These are from the Exposure International Photography Festival in the United Arab Emirates. And I've even got my name on it. You see, I didn't even nick it off someone else. Um, they're exhibition and participation. Participation is not the right word. Exhibition awards. So I've had exhibitions there, but also these are for my teaching, for my running of workshops that I do there. Um, you know, you do good stuff you get an award <clears throat> if you are part of it. Have they impacted my photography? No, no awards do. Uh, they might be good for your confidence. They have been good for my confidence. Do they impact the photography? Do they impact the number of clients you get? Maybe, maybe it draws attention. 
it's great to be able to put on your Facebook, hey, I've just won the, I don't know, Life Frame Award or the Sony Landscape Photographer Award. It gives you a level of credibility, certainly. I wouldn't have them there on the shelf so you lovely people can see them if they didn't. Do they bring clients flooding in the door? Hmm, probably not. Um, what is the most prestigious one I've got? I don't know. I would say those exposure awards are definitely the most prestigious, but then also that Kodak Gold Award behind me there. That was a big deal when I got that one. Any other questions in the open category? We've got maybe another 10 minutes. I'm quite happy to do that. What are the three main awards? Okay, got it. Hi, Mike. How do you feel about AI? How do I? Ah, now, this is a good question from Bob Cannon. How do I feel about AI and its effect upon photography as a profession? There was a lot of discussion of this at the exposure this year. I sat down and spent a morning with Lars Boring, who used to be head of World Press Photo. Um, yeah, it's having an impact on professional photography. It's changing things immensely. How is it changing them? We're not there yet, but we've got AI and it's evolving really, really, really quickly. We are reaching a point in time where, say, the photojournalist, the press photographer, let's say I've got a magazine uh, and it's a wedding photography magazine. And I think I want to do a piece in my magazine about photographs at Westminster Cathedral in London where you can create style prompts, which you can then feed into various different websites. And I'm trying to think of the name of one and I can't think what it's called. Mm, it's on the tip of my tongue, but it's gone. <clears throat> where you can tell it stuff like, I want wedding couple, blonde haired bride, brown haired groom wearing a green suit. Her dress is like this and like that. I want it to have the look of a 200 millimeter lens at f2.8 with dramatic backlighting coming in at a three quarter angle from the right of the frame. You've got to give it all those photo prompts, all that camera information. And yes, you're right, it will generate it. And all of a sudden I have got my picture. I haven't had to pay a photographer. I haven't had to buy image rights or anything. So it is absolutely having an impact. There is no question about it. But I do think there will be some level of backlash to this. It's not gonna have an impact so much on people who want some pictures of themselves, you know, on the beach with the family and the kids and the dogs and portraits and stuff. Uh, probably on small businesses who want their products photographing but it is certainly having an impact. And it's just a question of learning to work different. You know, you, st you still need a level of creativity and knowledge even to generate AI photos. Um, anyway, Matthew Parsons has just asked, is that a medium format camera on the shelf? <clears throat> Which is the best format? I don't think the format matters particularly, Matthew. Um, yeah, that is. One of my first medium format cameras it is a Mamiya 645. It's not even the Super. I did have a 645 Super which had the detachable back and all that stuff. Um, yeah, there you go. That's Here's your cartridge. You put your rolls of film onto there, slotted it in. If you've done my Masterclass in Photography online course, you will have seen me using this old camera to demonstrate some stuff because it's big and it's clunky. Yep, I used to shoot weddings on that once upon a time. Anyone else? Okay, Sue Owen, that's a good question. Do I think people can get swamped by the photo editing for customers trying to make the pictures perfect? It is. The photo editing side, the post-production, I'm going to call it photo editing because I don't edit photos, but I do do post-production and that's different. Just like you shoot a roll of film and the printer at the lab did the post-production. They adjusted the brightness, the dark, you know, the density, how bright it was, how contrasty it was, the colour saturation, the colour tone. Do you want it a little bit bluer and colder? Do you want it a bit warmer and yellower? For example, my film lab, they knew those things. They knew how I liked my pictures to look. A little bit bright, a little bit happy, quite rich in colour. And so Phil would print my pictures like that. But someone else who liked their pictures a little bit darker, a little bit moodier and a little bit, a little bit maybe bluer, a little bit colder in hue, he would print their pictures like that because that's what they liked. And that is why a professional lab charged, I think it was £56 to have a roll of 36 developed and printed by Phil as opposed to your 10 quid in Boots or the local mini lab. 
can you get bogged down with post-production? No, because once you've got a workflow, you can belt through it. It takes me about a day, maybe eight, 10 hours to do a wedding, um, three, 400 pitches, 300 pitches, something like that. Stick some music on and just crack into it. Um, but the key is you get it right in camera. You can't make a great picture if you don't have a great original. So a lot of the time, what am I doing? I'm maybe doing a bit of color correction. I'm not cropping. I'm not doing tons of dodging and burning and messing around. I also have a couple of presets, one for the Nikon, one for the Fuji, which I know there are certain things I tend to do to the Fuji and certain things tend to do with the Nikon. So I have a preset. So when those images are loaded into Lightroom, Lightroom automatically bangs that preset on the whole lot. It's a job I haven't got to do. And it's just a question of going through and, you know, just, just little tweaks, a little bit brighter, a little bit darker, a bit more contrast next, like that. If you've got a row of pictures, they're all taken in the same place and you only have to do one of them. And then you just paste the settings across the next 10 pictures that were taken in that light, in that situation. <clears throat> so no, but also you can outsource post-production. There are many people, um, particularly in India, but there are lots of places you can go and outsource your post-production. You send them your raw files, <clears throat> they do the work, just like Phil would with me, you need to establish a relationship so they understand what you want, how you want it to look, how you want them to do it. And then you don't have to do any of it. And it's quite cost effective as well. Matthew Parsons said, can I get Gareth Harford to do a tour? I will try my best, Matthew. I've been trying to get Gareth Harford to do some stuff. <clears throat> Um, <laughs> he's a difficult man to pin down. He's back on the GP, MotoGP Formula One circuit now. He's out of the country. Probably won't be able to get hold of him again until maybe August. But I will see what we can do, see if we can do one. That would be good. And also maybe some of the other um, exposure photographers, because I'm lucky enough now that I know some of the greats. Um, but I will come to that or talk to that in our photo creative group or something, not here. Um, any tips on dumping bad habits, said Bruce Robertson. If you want to do photography professionally, you've got to dump your bad habits. How do you dump them? You just dump them. <laughs> There's nothing else to do. There is no tip. Look, watch. <clears throat> I'm going to try and get hold of the pen. Oh, I missed it. Hang on, I'm going to try really hard to get hold of the pen. I missed it again. Oh, there must be a way to get hold of this pen. I'm going to really try hard to get hold of the pen. You don't try and dump. You don't need tips on how to get hold of the pen. You just get hold of the pen. That's all they're doing. Them. I'm sorry, that's brutal, but it's true. Do I have any plans to do some videos about mobile phone photography? Asked Covert86. A lot of smartphones have pro modes. The camera allows you for manual control and all the rest of it. I haven't got any plans for that at the moment, but it's something... I will consider, I have just been, I'm not allowed to talk about this because I'm under an NDA, <clears throat> but I have just made a mobile phone photography course for a training company in America, um, which in due time, if you're on my newsletter, then I will um, tell you about it when the time is right, because you may be interested in it. I haven't got any plans to do it at the moment. And also my phone doesn't even shoot raw. It has no, it's a really, really basic old iPhone, but it's not ruled out. Is there anything else here? Have I ever done live music, rock concert photography? And do I recall what camera settings work best? Two things, Bob. Yes, I have. My very first job as a photographer was to photograph a three day Greenpeace folk festival. Um, and I spent three days there photographing the people, the bands, the acts and the rest of it. It's not a big auditorium. It wasn't necessarily all at night in difficult light. Um, but yeah, I have done it. It was good fun. <clears throat> do I recall what camera settings work best? Bob, you need to go and do my masterclass in photography course. I'm sorry, my friend. The very fact you asked that question, unless, of course, you're winding me up being ironic, tells me that you need to understand what settings do because I had no idea what they were. They were the right ones for that situation. They will have changed many times over the course of the evening. Anyway, you're going to Cambodia next month. Any tips? Yes, if you're in Siem Reap, go to the old Khmer restaurant. It's fantastic. It's brilliant. They prop the front up on some sticks. They're all local boys in there. It's rowdy. It's noisy. They're friendly. It's brilliant. And I love the food. Um, <clears throat> Too many things, too big a question for this one, Irvay, I'm sorry. Well, it looks like we've come to the end of our questions. 
You have been very patient. I deeply apologize for all the complete screw up in the tech earlier on. I have no idea what caused that. I have got a mega fast connection here. My green light says it's excellent connection. And still on my YouTube panel, I can see nothing. I can only see your comments. So I don't know what's going on. It has been a pleasure to talk to you. Um, it's been great being here. Please, if you're not signed up to my newsletter, there is a thing popping out next to you, or there will be. There is a link in the description below. Please go and do that for some, for some good stuff. There will be a link popping out on the screen when we finish, but that won't be there till tomorrow after YouTube has processed this live stream. There are loads of links to good stuff. There are links to my masterclass, to free samples of it, to the newsletter, to the workshops and all the rest of it. And please hit the like button because it will make a big difference for me. Thank you for being here. I look forward to seeing you next time. Take care.